We have just wakened from our first decent sleep for weeks. Eight glorious, dreamless hours of utter exhaustion. The guns are still booming in the distance as energetically as when we fell on our camp beds without the formality of removing our clothes. We have not had our garments off for nine days, but there's been an unexpected lull this afternoon. No evacuations, only one funeral, and very few punishments, though we feel the usual midnight whistle will break our run of luck any time now. That gives us ten minutes to dress and stand by ambulances ready for convoy duty. In the meantime, we snuggle neck high in our flea bags and munch slabs of chocolate and stale biscuits. We have slept like logs through the evening meal, all except Tosh, who never misses a food call on principle. It is her turn to make the bovro. We gloatingly watch her light the little spirit lamp. We are hungry, but we are used to hunger. We are always hungry in varying degrees. Hungry, starving, ravenous. The canteen food is vile at its best, and at its worst, it defies description. We have existed mostly on our own bovril, biscuits, and slab chocolate since arriving in France. Who's up for bovril? Oh, me. me! Me! Nothing like a little hot beef water for the weary soul, eh girls? It is a discouraging diet for young women of twenty-three, which are six ages average, who are doing men's work. Tosh is the only one who can eat the canteen tack without vomiting or coming out in food boils. Also, she has been out longer than the rest of us and is more hardened. I can't take many more meals like that dinner last night. Hair on the food puts hair on your chest. <laughs> Ugh, really, Tosh. <laughs> I'd welcome that. I freeze my hide off out there. Haven't shaved my legs in weeks, cause it keeps me warm. You all are simply beyond the pale. How do you think those soldiers behave, BF? And aren't we living in hell just like them? We are ladies. No such thing as a lady on the front. Tosh is wandering around in the flickering candlelight, dressed in soiled woolen undervest and a voluminous pair of navy blue bloomers, chain-smoking yellow perils at a furious rate. There is something vaguely comforting in the Amazonian height and breadth of Tosh. She has the hips of a matron, a mind like a sewer, the courage of a giant, and the round, wind-reddened face of a dairymaid. She says she picked up her repertoire of language from the stable lads. Her father is a well-known sportsman. Nevertheless, Tosh is the idol of the entire convoy. I have adored her since the first night I arrived. That first, ghastly glimpse of 
blood and shattered men sent me completely to pieces. We backed our ambulances in a long row. Tosh was next in line to me. She watched me climb down, <laughs> saw me half fainting, retching my heart out against the bonnet of my bus, slipped from the driver's seat, seized me and shook sense into me. Pull yourself together, you bloody West Kensington lady with your bloody West Kensington tricks. You're loaded. And get back before Commandant spots you. You're holding up the line. Get back. I got back and drove till dawn. She bloody kick off, Smithy. But wait till you get gas cases, or worse, liquid fire. I don't think I can go on. I can't face those stretches of moaning men again, bleeding and raving. Oh, really? And what about the admiring family at home who are basking in your glory? My girl's doing her bit, driving an ambulance very near the line. Will they let you go off, Smithy? <laughs> Not likely. You'll never have the pluck to crawl home and admit your ordinary flesh and blood. It takes nerve to carry on here, but it takes as much to go home to flag crazy mothers and fathers. Lend me your scissors, Bug. What are you gonna do with them? You're not going to cut off your hair, Tosh. Your lovely hair. Why should I be a free lodging house for waifs and strays? Oh, Tosh, how can you? Short hair's terribly unfeminine. I wouldn't cut off my hair for anything. No, you vain little scut. You'd rather crawl. And no wonder I couldn't sleep. A bloody platoon. <laughs> I bet you'd all find you're as alive-o if only you carried out a smashing attack. I'd rather not find out. Of course you wouldn't, dear. Bug, can you give me a look? I'll cut mine too if I'm lousy. Sure, and then you check me. Deal. Perhaps we'll be a whole troop of shorn lambs. We get lice from the sitters, the cases well enough to sit beside us in front of the ambulances. Straight from the field dressing stations, before that, straight from the trenches. Who can wonder the sitters are alive with vermin? Tosh has cut her hair half off now, giving her a curiously lopsided effect. I wish I had her courage, but a mental vision of mother restrains me. Poor mother would die of horror if I came home on leave with my hair cut short as a man's. She wouldn't understand the filth and beastliness after my cheery letters home. Besides, Mother has always been so proud of my hair. It is long, but thin and mouse-colored. Nondescript. Like its owner. Like its owner's name. Helen Smith. Helen Z. Smith. How jealously I preserve the secret of that Z bestowed on me by my mother. Z was the heroine of a book Mother read the month before I arrived on Earth. She wanted me to grow up like Z, the paragon of beauty, virtue, and womanliness. Mother has been sadly disappointed over the first. I am still the second. But the third, well, Z was never an ambulance driver somewhere in France. You'll look awfully unsexed, Tosh. Unsexed? Me? With the breasts of a nursing mother? <laughs> <laughs> You're clear, Edwards. Now check me. Oh, thank God. I couldn't bear to see Edwards cut her gorgeous red curls. What would your beau think? Edwards does have gorgeous locks. You, on the other hand, BF. <gasps> Tosh, really? <laughs> Inwardly? We are proud to think our stomachs no longer heave up and down at the sight of a louse. After all, a few vermin, more or less, makes little difference. Our flea bags are full of them, in spite of Keatings and Lysol, and our bodies a mass of tiny red bites with the top scratched off. We are too hard work to spare the necessary time to keep clean. It is four weeks since we had a bath all over, nine days since we had a big wash. We haven't had the time. We dare not hot bathe in case we have to go out immediately afterwards into the snow. 
The last girl who did it is now in hospital with double pneumonia and is not expected to live. All done. Now I'll just crumple this newspaper full of the devils, stick it in my chamber pot and light a match. Look at that. Wholesale slaughter. Well, it's the fashion in our circles, Nisba. Anyone got a fag? Don't let Commandant see. Oh, you mean Mrs. Bitch. I'm not afraid of her. Yesterday, I had committed the awful offence of warming my hands near the canteen fire because they were too frozen to go on cleaning my engine. And Commandant caught me. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be ambulance cleaning, I thought. My fingers are frozen and I came here to warm them. Oh, then perhaps you haven't enough work to do to keep your fingers warm. Perhaps a little extra work will help. Commandant is dreadfully efficient. Like most dreadfully efficient women, she is universally loathed. Even the BF has gone as far as calling her Mrs. You Know Itch. Time for seconds. If there isn't a parcel soon with the new supply, we go out empty tomorrow. You look like a Shakespearean page, Tosh. Or Rosalind. I hate being lousy. I quite like it. Oh, me too. Not I. Thank God I'm clean. Must be your guardian angel, BF. Mine's gone on strike. What was supper like, Tosh? Shite! <gasps> Tosh! Tosh christened her the BF, but we are quite convinced that, although flattered at being on nickname level with the niece of an earl, she hasn't the vaguest notion that the cryptic letters signal anything other than her own initials, Bettina Farmer. The BF is very fond of talking about doing her bit. She would go down terribly well with my parents. Now, BF, you ought not overdo doing your bit with the amusing officers, or you may not be so amused in the end. I can tell by your face, Tosh, you're being obscene, but I do not see your point. Oh, you'll see that if you overdo doing your bit, won't you, girls? Do you know what she means? <laughs> oh, BF. The Bovril is good. We want more, but there is none. Tosh empties the chamber of charred paper out of the window, letting in a blast of icy air. The wind is rising, moaning round the convoy like a thousand angry witches. We shiver. Is it going to snow again? Tosh tries on her cap. It is several sizes too large now, owing to her depleted hair. We all lazily pro-offer advice. The BF produces a safety pin. Tosh pins her cap and tries it on. The safety pin is not strong enough. It flies apart and jabs her in the back of the neck. Ah, think Peter's holy trousers. Tosh, you're blasphemy. What? You don't call that blasphemous. If you really want to hear some blasphemy. You can say what you want, Tosh, but it is blasphemous to talk of St. Peter having trousers. Holy ones. I did make them holy, BF. Any kind. It's blasphemous to say he's got any kind at all. BF, don't tell me there are no trousers in heaven. Don't tell me the men go trotting about showing all they've- <gasps> Tosh! <laughs> in the silence, the guns grow ominous and audible. More ominous than when last we listened to their eternal rumble. They are always louder at night when the day noises have ceased. God, I hate those bloody guns. We stare ahead. We hate and dread the days following on the guns when they boom without interval. Trainloads of broken human beings. Half-mad men pleading to be put out of their misery. Torn and bleeding and crazed men obeying orders like a herd of cattle. Dumbly, pitifully straggling in the wrong direction. As senseless as a flock of sheep. 
My last letter home opens before me. Sent in response to innumerable complaints concerning the brevity of my crossed out field postcards. It is such fun out here. And of course, I'm loving every minute of it. It's so splendid to be really in it. The only kind of letter home they expect. The only kind they want. The only kind they will have. Tell them that you hate it. Tell them that you fear it. That you are terror-stricken. Tell them that all the ideals and beliefs you ever had have crashed about your gun-deafened ears. That you don't believe in God, or them, or the infallibility of England, or anything but bloody war, and wounds, and foul smells, and smutty stories, and smoke, and bombs, and lice, and filth, and noise, noise, noise! That you live in a world of cold sick fear, a dirty world of darkness and despair. That you want to crawl ignominiously home, away from these painful, writhing things that once were men. These shattered, tortured faces that dumbly demand what it's all about in Christ's name. That you want to find somewhere where life is quiet and beautiful and lovely just as it was before the world turned khaki and blood-colored. That you want to creep into a refuge where there is love instead of hate. Tell them these things and they will reply on pale, mauve, deckled-edged paper calling you a silly, hysterical little girl. You always were inclined to exaggerate, darling. You stick it, darling. Go on doing your bit, because England is proud of her brave daughter, so very proud. It's so splendid to be really in it. I always knew you were marked for brave adventure. Mm, I've got two girls out in France now, and a son in training. He'll be all allowed any minute, he says. Uh, one of my girls pretty well in the firing line. Not allowed to say, of course. Censor, no that. Address, someone in France. Proud to do a bit for the old flag. Proud to do a bit. God bless her. Proud to do her bit for the old flag. Oh, Christ, I'm only 21, and nobody cares because I've been pitchforked into hell. Out of it, my petite harlots. I am the last ambulance home, which means no hot cocoa. My luck has been dead out this convoy. The others struck it fairly easily, but I started off badly. I got number 13 hospital at the station gate. Not only the farthest one out of camp, but the one on top of the hill with a rough, detestable, badly winding road dotted with irregular heaps of snow-covered stones, hard enough to negotiate by daylight, but hell to drive up at a crawl with a load of wounded on a pitch-black night, when the slightest jar may mean death to a man inside. We all loathe drawing number 13. It would be my luck on a night when the roads are so ice-polished, the wheels seem to be skating, no grip at all, and the wind is blowing a gale, nearly turned the old bus turtle. Next journey I was too fed up to care. This was not my lucky night with a vengeance. I was carrying a spotted fever case, which meant 
that after I had been unloaded in the front entrance of number 13, I had to have the ambulance disinfected and myself sprayed until I smelt like a newly scrubbed public lavatory. I dimmed the headlights and drove downhill at a terrific pace to make up lost time. But my luck was again out. Commandant saw me drive in the yard. Where have you been? What do you mean by slacking in this disgraceful manner? I had a spotted fever case. No excuse. You should have been back a quarter of an hour ago. Get reloaded at once. Enough time has been wasted without wasting more in idle conversation. Freezing outwardly, but boiling inside, I backed the bus to the train again to be reloaded with another spotted fever stretcher. I am past caring about my personal safety. Once the ambulance is empty, I can let her rip and to hell with the consequences. The station yard at last. Have I escaped Commandant? <coughs> Not late again. I had another spotted fever case. I told you that's no excuse. But number 13 is so far out. You will report for punishment in the morning at 10.30. But I have to clean my own ambulance at 10.30. 10 then. I could have done number 13 in half the time. Less. Mrs. Bitch must give God the inferiority complex twice daily. He took seven days to make the world, according to Genesis. Mrs. Bitch could have done it in half the time. She can do anything in half the time it takes anyone else. One of these days, I will murder her. Slowly, and reverently, and very painfully. I will take lots of time over it. Unless I meet her coming up the hill with dim lights denoting an empty ambulance. In which case, I will crash her bus head on and take the risk of my own skidding into the valley afterwards. Twice more to number 13. A man vomiting the whole of the last trip. Never ceased for a second, poor fellow. We clean our own ambulances, so I knew what that would mean in the morning. He died as the stretcher bearers lifted him out. I was glad. Out of hell at last. Again to the station, to be told by the sergeant. You can go home. Train is unloaded. You are, you know, the last one out tonight by a good half hour. Back at last. I pull into the ambulance line, switch my engine off, crawl down stiff and creaking in every joint, bang my chilled hands together to restore circulation, switch my lights off and tramp into the mess room. The fire, dead. Of course. H.Z. Smith. Present. Silly bitch. I wish she would drop dead in her tracks. I poke my tongue out at the receding steps on the bare boards and inspect the cocoa jugs, hoping someone has had the decency to leave a spoonful in one. No luck. Empty, as I anticipated. Where are the matches? I stumble over a shoe in the darkness and Tosh mutters. Oh, for Christ's sake. Keep quiet, can't you? How in the hell can I keep quiet when you leave your shoes in the middle of the room and hide the matches? No sleep for the men in the trenches tonight. Poor wretches. Are they as cold and unhappy and homesick as I am? I can hardly believe it is possible. A distant glow on the skyline shows clearly through the window. Yellow and warm, like London from the outskirts. The front. Now and again there is a distant explosion. The flash quite visible. The explosion quite audible and distinguishable above the guns. A mine or a bomb attack. More killed. More wounded. More convoys.
I worm my body into a flea bag. It is surprisingly warm. My feet touch something. Something hot. A hot water bottle. They have made a hot water bottle for me. <laughs> my friends. They have not forgotten me. This touch of kindliness finishes me completely. The tears roll down my cheeks. <laughs> the laugh does not irritate me. I am too gloriously drowsy. The grateful warmth steals over my aching limbs. I shall not be able to leave behind the hatred that will possess me to my dying day of Commandant's police whistle. It rouses everything vile within me. Not long ago, I was a gentle, pliable creature of no particular virtues or vices. My temper was even, my nature amiable, and my emotions practically non-existent. Now, I am a sullen, smouldering thing, liable to burst into a flaming fire of rage without the slightest warning. We are dressed. Fully. We give each other a short survey. BF, you've a wrinkled stocking. Helen, your hair sticking out on the side. Where is my bray? Toss your tie. Here, Helen, your collar. Hurry! Commandant insists that we are carefully and neatly dressed for 7.30 roll call. White shirts, ties, smoothly dressed hair, brushed, uncrumpled uniforms, even though we may have been driving till 5 a.m. We arrive just in time. Commandant has been up since dawn, by all accounts. She would have made a good wife for Napoleon. He didn't need any sleep either. Roll call is over. We crowd round the fire. It is my day to do cook's room. There are many fatigues I detest, but cleaning cook's room gets my back up more than anything. Why should I clean it? Why cannot she clean her own as we all do? She has about a quarter of the work we have. She is a fat, common, lazy, impossible pertinent slut who leaves little dusty rings of hair littered about for us to collect. Her room reeks of stale sweat, for she sleeps with the window hermetically sealed. It astounds me why the powers that be in the London headquarters stipulate that refined women of decent education are essential for this ambulance work. Why should they want this class to do the work of strong navvies on the cars in addition to the work of scullery maids? Possibly because this is the only class that suffers in silence, that scorns to carry tales. We are such cowards. We do not face being called cowards and slackers, which we certainly shall be if we complain. What did you think you came out of France for? A holiday? Don't you realize there's a war going on? So we say nothing. <laughs> Poor fools. We deserve all we get. Tosh stirs the fire with her toe and watches the kitchen door gloomily. You got 13 last night, didn't you? And spotted fever, twice. Not to mention being bullied by Mrs. Bitch for running behind schedule. Poor old Smith. What a rotten shame. It is amazing what a little sympathy can affect. I feel almost human by the time breakfast arrives. We gather round the canteen table, chattering, our tongues loosened by the hot tea. Breakfast is worse than ever. The bread is hard, what there is of it, and the margarine smells of... I hesitate for a comparison. Still, the tea is wet and hot and, for a wonder, plentiful. It will run to a cup and a quarter each. We cheer up. After all, we are young and easily cheered up. 
The latest war story goes the rounds of the table. Something General Joffrey is supposed to have said when first he saw the Scottish kilt. Of course he didn't say it, but it is fun to pretend he did. He said, Pour la guerre, ce n'est pas bon, mais pour la mort, c'est magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> and there may be mail today. We tell one another there is sure to be. We have all written home for supplies. Tosh for Bovril, and Huntley and Palmer's best assorted and potted meat. Me for Bovril and ginger biscuits. We have a heated argument as to the rival merits of best assorted and ginger. Ginger wins easily. Ginger warms you up, sustains you. Some good news then. Girls, I'm engaged. <gasps> oh, ch three cheers for Edwards. Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! <laughs> now, now tell us, did you really have a choice or are you in the family way? My god, no! How dare you! Then, more by luck than management. Stop it. You must give us the details. Yes! Yes! Is it the Aussie? The one who sends you chocolate biscuits every mail? Yes, it's him. I approve then! So do I. Oh, just think. You know you'll accept, so you're engaged. But the Aussie won't know until your answer arrives by mail. You know he lost his right leg in the war. But I'm glad, because he's done now. The trenches won't get him again. No man of mine will ever go to any war again. I know too much. Let the people who make the wars fight them. I would rather see a child of mine dead than see him a soldier. I... I don't think that's very patriotic, dear. You wouldn't. You're the type that loses her son in the war and erects a tablet in the village church. A mother's proud memory. Proud. Because her son has been murdered after murdering some other woman's son. It isn't murder to kill your enemies in wartime, darling. Enemies? Our enemies aren't the Germans. Our enemies are the politicians we pay to keep us out of war and who are too damned inefficient to do their jobs properly. After 2,000 years of civilization, this folly happens. It is time women took a hand. The men are failures. This war shows that. Women will be the ones to start war, you'll see. If they can't do anything else, they can refuse to bring children into the world to be maimed and murdered. Once women buckled on their men's swords once they believed in that that death of glory boys jingo but this time they're in it themselves and the pretty romance has gone war is dirty there's no glory in it vomit and blood look at us we came out here puffed out with patriotism there isn't one of us who wouldn't go back tomorrow the glory of the war my god my darling we are doing our bit a bf you're the most dangerous type of fool there is. So, someone ought to collect women like you in a big hall and drop a bomb. A whacking big one. You're a true trip off the old block that the pig-headed, sentimental, brainless old block that got us out here. Patriotic speeches. Fighting for world freedom. I don't know what we're fighting for. Who does? But it isn't for world freedom. Nothing so pretty. We had to fight. We are in the right. Aren't we? The church says so, dear. God is on our side. They even drag poor God into it. Priests are holding war from the pulpit. The, the blasphemous. All the same. I don't think you're very patriotic, dear. Oh, oh, pass the ruddy Maggie Anne. What's the use? The closed mind. You can't cope with it. At 10 a.m., I report to the Commandant for punishment. I listen to her harangue in silence. Once I used to argue with her, but it only means more punishment. I am to take tea orderly today and clean Commandant's car in addition to my own. I wonder what she would do if I suddenly sprang at her and dug my fingers into her throat, her strong, red, thick throat that is never sore that laughs scornfully at germs, that needs no wrapping up even when the snow is up to your chin. Have you nothing to say, Smith? I don't understand, Commandant. 
What do you expect me to say? Thank you very much. Insolence! You had better clean the WC as well. Perhaps that will teach you discipline. Cleaning an ambulance is the foulest and most disgusting job it is possible to imagine. We are unanimous on this point. Even yet, we hard and old timers cannot manage it without catting on exceptionally bad mornings. We do not mind cleaning the engines, doing repairs. It's dealing with the insides we hate. The stench that comes out as we open the doors each morning nearly knocks us down. Pools of stale vomit from the poor wretches we have carried the night before. Corners the sitters have turned into temporary lavatories for all purposes. Blood and mud and vermin and the stale stench of trench feet and gangrenous wounds. Poor souls, they cannot help it. Half the time they are unconscious of what they are doing, racked with pain and jolted about on the rough roads for try as we may, and the cases all agree that women drivers are ten times more thoughtful than the men drivers, we cannot altogether evade the snow-covered potholes. Our ambulance women take entire control of their cars, doing all running repairs and all cleaning. This appeared in a signed article by one of our head officials in London, forwarded to me by mother last week. It was entitled, Our Splendid Women. I wondered then, how many people comfortably reading it over the breakfast table realized what that all cleaning entailed? None, I should imagine, much less the writer of the muck. Certainly we ourselves had no idea before we got here. I wonder afresh as I don my overalls and rubber boots. I know what to expect this morning. Remembering that poor, wretched soul I carried on my last trek to number 13, who will be buried by one of us today. I am nearly sick on the spot at the sight greeting me, but I have no time for squeamishness. I have Commandant's bus in addition to my own to get through. Commandant's 11 to 12 inspection is no idle formality. She goes over every square inch of each ambulance inside and out. The engines are revved up, the tire pressures tested, everything. With all her faults, she knows her job. If only she had a little heart, she would be an ideal woman for this sort of work. 10.40. Done with my ambulance. Can I do it? I make a beeline for Commandant's bus. First in the line, of course. I open the doors. Oh, God, gangrene. My stomach heaves up and down. I run behind the ambulance where the others can't see. 10.45. With clenched teeth, I set to work. Swilling, scrubbing, disinfecting. When shall I ever sleep again? In at 3.15 last night, up at 7.30 this morning, four and a quarter hours, all I shall get today, all the others are likely to get today, with luck, we may snatch an hour or so before the midnight convoy. 10.55. I am safe if her engine is in good running order. I manage a jug of boiling water for the radiator. She starts fairly easily. She sounds pretty good to me. A hasty polish. Eleven o'clock. Done it. Here comes Commandant. Punctual to the tick. Hoping for victims. Hmm. All right. Pass with a caution on the polish. You missed two spots. But since it's a snowy day, I'll overlook it this time. Free to go. To our rooms to change back into uniforms. No post in yet. That means eating the canteen filth today. We shall probably be poisoned, but we are so starving after our work in the snow, we are prepared to eat anything. Smith! Yes? I thought I told you to clean the WC. 
I know I was going to do it after dinner. Please don't lie to me. Perhaps tea orderly tomorrow as well as today will assist your memory in the future. I change back into overalls, get a pail, and stagger to the WC. When I'm done, I take the pail out to the outhouse and meet Tosh coming in. What have you been doing? Cleaning the loo. <gasps> you ladies with influence. Dinner is nearly over by the time I have changed. One mouthful and I finish. This soup stew literally stinks. Tosh lifts a spoon and grins. Bon appetit! Being tea orderly has its compensations on a foul day like this. I am not sorry to be kept busy in the canteen setting cups and saucers and cutting bread. At least there is a fire there. Although it means waiting on 40-odd impatient drivers from 3 till 6.30. And this afternoon there is very little rest. There are eleven funerals from different hospitals, and a record number of evacuations. An evacuation is the jolliest job of all. The cases who are well enough to stand the long journey to England. It is a joy to hear them singing. Sometimes we join in and forget the empty hospital beds so soon to be filled up with the next pain-racked convoy. Jack Dunn, son of a gun, over in France today. Keeps fit, doing his bit, up to his eyes in clay. Each night, after a fight, to pass the time along, he's got a little gramophone that plays this song. Take me back to the old glory to Put me on the train to London town Take me over there, crawl me anywhere. Little bees are burning and I don't care. I should love to see my best girl cutting up the way you used to be. Woo! Tiddly idly party, ready to come to the party. Right here is the place for me. I should love to see my best girl. Apple and plum again, 
same stuff isn't it rough? Fed up with it, I am. All for a pot of Auntie Liza's raspberry jam. Take me back to dear old Blighty. Put me on the train for London town. Take me over there. Drop me anywhere. Birmingham, Leeds, or Manchester. Well, I don't care. I should love to see my best girl. Cuddling up again, we soon shall be. Oh, tiddly diddly lady, hurry me home to Blighty. Blighty is the place for me.